freaking. Happy sport Thanksgiving. Some people are sleeping, some people are shopping, some people are skipping out on work, on school, but no, we're here. <laughs> no, we're hustling <laughs> all the time. We're out here in the streets. Yeah. Every time we're mad. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Do it. We, we don't sleep, we don't blink, we don't wink, we just go hard all the time. Show your support, like, subscribe. Let's <laughs> <laughs> actually just get into, let's get into this one. Um, so this was actually a final problem, so I just want to do one from beginning to end, where we just kind of combine all these ideas before moving on to the last transforms, which uh, should be fun. Uh, so yeah, how do you show that something is a regular singular point? Uh, but what do we need to do before that? First, you need to write it in standard form. And so then we're going to find the limit as x approaches 0, or this guy, um, of x minus 0 times That is going to be two thirds, you'll notice, and the limit is x approaches zero, but x minus zero squared uh, times this guy, which here it's going to be third plus.
here, I'm going to change all n's to n minus 1's. Now everybody looks like n plus r. not, 
Another way to look at it is to just pretty much try to force it to look like a normal by getting the x squared term in the first part and seeing who falls out of line for the rest of the thing. Um, so, so, it says we must find the series solution corresponding to the larger root, assuming that uh, a0 is 1. So, we have to find the larger root here. That's going to be 3r squared minus r is 0. We have r times 3r minus 1. <coughs> and so we have r equals 0. We have r equals 1 third. This is the large root, which means I am going to use my a and b minus a and minus 2 minus 5a and minus 1 over n plus 1 third times 3n plus 1. Just 3n. Oh. Right, because this is going to be one third, and that's going to die. Um, notice that I could also just take this three and multiply it in here. Right, so that's going to be ultimately the uh, three n plus one times n. And now we just care about the first four terms. Did we say first zero? First? Let's now I'm just going to find the first four terms of the series using that formula. And then you write it out. So, A0, we were given that. They told us that was 1. Uh, A1 is going to be, if I plug in 1 for n there, I would actually get minus A minus 1 minus. 5a0 all over n times 3 n plus 1. Uh, so that's going to be 4. Now, remember our assumption if the subscript is negative, assuming it's to be 0, and we know our a0 is actually 1, so this just becomes minus 5 over 4. Then a2 is if I plug in n equals 2, I would get minus a0 minus 5a1 over, plugging in n equals 2, I get 7 times 2, that's 14. We know a0, so we put 1 there, right? Come in. Since we know a0. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to keep back substituting. So a0, I'm going to plug in 1. For a1, I'm going to plug in uh, minus 5 over 4. So this is minus 1, this would be plus 25 over 4, over 14. That is going to be 29 over. Uh, it's a minus 20, right? So it's going to be uh, 21 over 4. Divide by 14. Divide by 14. 1 times 14. And 7 can go into both of these. 7 to that goes uh, 2 times. 7 to that goes 2 times. So that's 3 eighths. A0, A1, A2, that's three terms, so it does need one more. A3, just plugging in n equals three, we're going to get minus A1 minus 5A2 all over uh, 30. Minus A1 is 5 over 4, 5A2. 15 over 8, over 30. So this I can look at as 10 over 8 minus 15 over 8 is minus 5 over 8 times 30. Uh, 5 can go to 6 times. So that's minus 1 over 48. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I missed the bit. So should that be 3 and minus 1? 3 and is that a three and a plus one Uh, no. I just turned right? Because I actually just plugged in one third into here. Right? So, so I have n plus one third. And then here, if I plug in one third, three times a third is one, minus the one, that dies. And so then I have three n. And then I just took this 3, and I multiplied these 2, so that's 3n plus 1. And then the n Because I didn't like the third. Right? 
Yeah, like sure. having a one third would be more annoying than this already. Okay. So uh, that's that's basically it. So our y is going to be. I'm approximating it with the first uh, four four terms. So it's going to look like x to the r times a zero plus a one x plus a two x squared plus a three x cubed. Our r was a third, and so that's going to be one plus minus five over four x plus three over eight x squared <coughs> minus one over forty-eight x cubed, and that will give me four terms. So that's our approximate. I have a question. Yeah. Actually, why does the recursive formula not work for n equals zero? I can see that you have you have a zero in the denominator, but why does it not work? Oh, because that is our initial condition. So a zero, uh, by our definition, is going to be the uh, y is zero. It's always a given value, so it's not something that you would get from recursive formula either way. So it, it doesn't have to fit this pattern. Okay. Although the first formula holds for values of n less than zero, it only has a discontinuity at zero. Uh, it, it it holds for less than zero because we took that assumption that if our subscript is negative, we automatically assume the coefficient is zero. So there's another kind of given status for that. Um, but yeah, in general with something like this, if you actually went into the complex numbers, you allow the coefficients of the negative subscripts to actually exist, um, you kind of have a singularity here. It's just, it's part of the course of the that is. This is a singular point. So there's going to be a point where uh, things at that point is kind of shaky, but we can expand from that point. I have a question. Yes. For the solution, what if we chose uh, r is equal to zero and we fix the conditions in it? Now, would that be as equally as good of an approximation as uh, r is equal to one third? Yeah. What What you will notice that would give you a separate solution, though. This answer here is only one of the. Think of this as the y one. Right. Remember, there's a c one y one plus a c two y two. Um, when they say find a solution corresponding to the larger root, you're actually just finding one so of the two solution. possible solutions. It's half the same. Yeah. Um, and that's because, in general, to find two solutions, it's kind of annoying in this, like I would say. If the, if, the, if the roots differ by an integer, there's a whole thing you have to go through. And uh, there are just a lot of cases that we just don't want to deal with. So we just say, find half the solution, the half that deals with the larger root, it's going to look like this. Um, so, we've been using the uh, method where we set the limits to negative infinity to infinity on um, a lot of these. Yeah. Um, I just want to know if I can still learn the other method, uh, if there's any real Completely advantage. your preference. Okay. Yeah. Is there any advantage, um, like, bookkeeping-wise? Because that's the only thing I can see. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that is the only advantage to the other one that I can see as well. Like, it's a little bit longer to actually write out, but at the end of the day, um, things kind of match up. So, for example, if you did it the longer way, like this equation would have popped up when I started evaluating coefficients to get all the series and start at the same place. So you can kind of double check yourself in that way. I mean, that, okay, that's actually okay. interesting. So you, yeah. you, you so, don't so see that. If you paid attention to the subscripts and you try to get everyone to start the same, you have to evaluate the first two series. You'll get a bunch of terms out here. You'll get something times a zero x to the r, and it turns out that that thing that's going to be in there will actually be this guy. Okay, so and, and so you you'll see. Oh yeah, so my calculations are probably not messed up because I literally get. What are the odds that I'm going to get exactly the same numbers? And that's deep enough into the process to where you you would know like. Yeah. To continue right now, right? Yeah. Okay. So you can actually figure this out using the shortcut I told you, or using this, or if you pay attention to the subscripts, this expression is going to show up as a coefficient of that guy. And you set that equal to zero and say, oh, the R must uh, read that. Thank you. Yeah. But uh, in general, it's a personal preference. I don't, one or the other is fine. Um, yeah, that's that.
There's one other thing I wanted to show you in series. Just making a small detour here. Now, it's usually not required, but it's uh, something that's kind of nice. So you might as well just know about it. Uh, recall. And the, and the nice thing about this is it can help us with non constant coefficients without being extremely annoying.
evaluated at x equals zero. That's if you right. plug in zero here, that's going to be zero. Cosine of zero is one, and y of zero is a zero. So this is just minus a zero. Don't you have to divide by two? <coughs> yes. So now, what you will notice here is that, but a two is equal to y double prime of zero divided by two. But y double prime of zero, I just found, but just minus a zero. And I can keep playing this game. I can just keep finding derivatives, evaluating them at zero, and then divide them by the factorial, and that will give me the next coefficient. So if I wanted to find the a sub 3, so I know that a sub 3 is going to be equal to y triple prime evaluated at 0 over 3 factorial. But what is y triple prime? So y triple prime evaluated at 0 is going to be, I'm just going to differentiate this. Now this is just regular uh, Calc 1 derivatives. Uh, product rule here. So derivative of sine x is
think in my rush to get out of here, I kind of got myself mixed up. I didn't. I mixed up who was the K and who was the S, so let's actually start over. So we have a power series. So this is a way to express a function as a power series. And it's going to be a n x to the n, where your n is uh, 0 to infinity. Uh, we want a complex, we want a complex, a continuous analog. Is there a continuous version of a power series? So the first thing we do is we change, just to change notation to understand that we're doing something different. So change n to t's, where t, the end, these are just positive integers. t can be any real number in 0 to infinity. So t is a real number. So I don't want to count by integers anymore. Let, the, let these coefficients be any real number. Um, also, change a n to some function of t. Right? So a n is normally some formula that depends on n. It's now going to be some formula that depends on t. Um, because I'm changing all these variables to be real variables. And also, what's going to happen is you're going to change basically the summation to an integral, which is the continuous analog of a discrete sum. So, we use this symbol when we want to sum things discreetly. There's a specific first guy, and the second guy, and the third guy. If you want to be able to add up along the real numbers where there is no first, second, third guy, uh, that's going to be what we do. So ultimately, the power of the continuous version becomes integral from 0 to infinity of f of t times x. Yes. Could the domain of key also extend to negative infinity, but all the uh, f of t at negative infinity would be zero? Yes. Uh, this, this, oh, there, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention something. The thing is, once you extend outside the window that I mentioned last time, things will work, but you'll get complex numbers. You'll, you'll have situations where you have to deal with complex numbers, and we just kind of don't want to. That's outside our scope. And so now, like I said, x to the t, that's just an exponential function, but it's a very weird exponential function. So uh, change x to the t to, well, we can write this as e to the ln of x to the t, which is e to the ln t x. And for convergence, basically force our x to be less than 1 in absolute value, and for uh, real value functions, we even restrict the x to be even smaller, uh, so only the half one. Okay? So we could end up talking about negative x's, but once you start plugging in negative x into a logarithm, that automatically brings you to the complex numbers. And, uh, the, I, I don't think any math class before this has taught you how to deal with a complex logarithm. It, it's a whole other animal to itself. So we restrict our x's to this. Now, if our x is between 0 and 1, that means ln of x is going to be negative. So we set. I don't want to have to worry about ln of x, so I'm going to set ln of x equal to some function s, negative s, where s greater than 0 is in R. And finally, Do this integral, however you have to do it. 
uh, depending on what f is. Uh, and these guys here, these limits are going to be plugged in for t. Of course, they're going to take a limit as n approaches infinity for this part. But ultimately, your answer is going to have a variable s in it, right? So this will actually give you some function of s. And this is called the Laplace transform of the small function. So f of s is called the Laplace transform. have been very useful for us in the past. I mean, if you look at it with theoretical eyes, integration by substitution is doing something like this. Um, a lot of your integration techniques can be phrased in a way like this. And it's worked out very well so far. So we are very hopeful for the possibilities here. Um, so what I want to do now is just, that is the definition of the Laplace transform. You should actually know that. So I ask you, what is the definition of the Laplace transform of a function f of t? You're going to write that down. So let's actually do some examples. Find the Laplace transform of the following. Suppose my f of t is a constant. And suppose my f of t were something like e to the a constant times t, a, a constant. Suppose my f of t looks like t to the n, where m is a positive integer, right? So it looks like a polynomial, like a t squared, a t cubed, a t to the fifth, something like that. What would the Laplace transform of these guys look like? Um, for a, you should just factor out k, right? So, I'm going to say, all right, f of Let me give you another notation for this. Which I'm going to use now. F of S is sometimes referred to as, you have this big fancy L. Ooh. You put the F of T inside it, and then you put a little S. So it's a Laplace transform of this function, and we know it's a function of S, so we write that. Um, if you're lazy, you might just write the Laplace transform of the F of T. Or just the Laplace transform of f. Like you, you progressively get lazier and lazier as you go on because eventually you start doing this thing so often and you're like, man, you know what I mean. <laughs> you just start, eventually you just devolve into writing it like this, like big L of f, and you know, oh, he means the Laplace transform. Um, okay, so just an FYI here. Uh, so let's actually do that. Let's find the Laplace transform of these. Uh, we can probably put the first one here. Hey. So, if I want the Laplace transform of k, how do I do that? Well, you follow the definition. The Laplace transform is the integral from 0 to infinity of k times e to the minus st. Integral of this? e to the negative st over s. Over negative s. So it's minus yeah. k over s, e to the minus st uh, between 0 and infinity. Yes, technically I know. So should we limit? Don't yeah, limit that last one. Oh. <laughs> yes, we're big kids now. We know what's going on. Like, we know how babies are made. You don't have to tell us this anymore, mom and dad. Okay. Sometimes I'm just going to write infinity up there without writing. You know what I mean. Jeez. Okay. 
<laughs> so now, eventually, um, you're going to plug it in infinity. So what you have is the limit as n approaches infinity of minus k over s e to the minus s times n plus k over s As n approaches infinity, what happens here? Zero. That goes to zero. And so we end up with k over s. Wouldn't that depend on the sign of s? Uh, is s positive? No, it's not going to matter because k over s is going to be some number. Right, but uh, either the negative s times n would be positive. So you would have. No, one. s is assumed to be positive, remember? It is. I, I did that, I, I erased it. But we made that assumption. Remember, I said that ln of x was negative, and we set ln of x equals negative s, where s is positive. So it's, it's assumed that s is positive, which means negative s and is negative. So, so we have uh, negative power. Could we also write k over negative natural log of x? Come again? Could we also write the solution as k over negative natural log of x? k over negative natural log of x. X. Well, the natural log of x, yes. So, um, but that's it. So, if you have the Laplace transform of a constant, uh, it's just a constant divided by s. Turns out. So that's the transform. It will transform any constant to a constant divided by s. So remember, a transformation is just uh, a function whose domain and, and range consist of other functions. So it takes functions of t and it connects them to functions of s. If I, if I take a constant function, it will connect it to a function that looks like this. <laughs> so the, like, ideologically, there's like a very degree of like, predictability here, right? Yeah. And that's what we're using to... Yes, we're, eventually we're going to use this actually uh, use some cool stuff. Let's just uh, get through these though. The Laplace transform of e to the a t well, what would that look like? Well, this is just the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the at times e to the minus st dt. Now, this is going to be equal to the integral of 0 to infinity of e to the p a minus s minus a t. Just leave that somewhere. Right? Just combine the powers here. Then, this will be, uh, integrate that, uh, we would have minus 1 over s minus a e to the minus s minus a times t between 0 and infinity. Now, now we have to worry about the power, right? What is the a? Now, we need s to be uh, greater than a for this to work. Because you divide by zero. Oh. So we need s greater than a. Why? Because if s is less than a, this is negative, and a negative times a negative is a positive, so I have an e to a positive part, and then that part is going on to infinity, it's not going to converge. We need this to happen. Right? So we're going to take that assumption. We're going to assume s is bigger than a, so we know s is positive, assuming it's also bigger than a, if a happens to also be a positive number. Um, and with that, if we plug in infinity, this is going to go to 0 minus a negative. If we plug in 0 uh, for t, that just goes to that. So that's another thing. The Laplace transform of e to the at just 1 over s minus a, and that's something we know. If a is less than s. And it only works if s is, less, is greater than a. If s is less than a, then it, it doesn't exist. Professor, what is that z sign? This is positive <coughs> Natural numbers. You can also plot natural numbers.
numbers, but some people include zero, some people don't. Is zero natural? Huh? Is zero natural? Some people do it. Some people start from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, others start from 1, 2, 3, 4, so I just put Z plus, so that everyone, everyone would agree that that means positive integer. Um, yeah. One thing I want you to appreciate here, what does this expression remind you of, S minus A? It's the geometric series, the convergence. No, that's A over 1 minus R. But if I, if, if I look at something like 1 over x versus 1 over x minus a, what would that do? If it approaches infinity? Or just like that? That's a factor or something. Actually, it's a horizontal shift. That's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, notice here. <laughs> so, multiplying by an exponential in the regular universe, well, that can cause a lot of disruption. You, blows up, right? Multiply by an exponential in the, La in the Laplace transform universe, it just boop, shift over horizontally, right? That, that's, that's going to, things like that matter, right? So like, multiply by e to the 5,000 t, okay, shift it over 5,000 units to the right. Pretty much have the same situation, just moved over a little bit, right? It, it doesn't get too crazy, so. Are Laplacian graphs interesting to look at then? All graphs are just things like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, that's one thing. Uh, what would t to the n look like? T to the n. So, oh, originally I, I kind of looked like, uh, I kind of did t squared. And I, oh, let's just do t to the n. Let's do all of them. So, c, the plus transform of t to the n. Well, this is going to be 0 to infinity of t to the n, e to the minus st, t. What we can do here is kind of do integration by parts, obviously. I'm going to choose the, this guy to be the guy I'm differentiating. Can you just do and uh, rewrite the n as e to the natural log of t n? Uh, natural log of t. And then uh, you could write QB as e to the uh, e natural log of yeah, e to the power of n. It will be n outside, and you could add the two e's, and then you could figure out from there. Because uh, you know, I don't really think that's going to be much simpler than this, but that seems like a fair option. Uh, what would this start to look like as it's winding down? Eventually, this is going to get to zero, right? What would it look like just before that? Um, the highest order derivative that we have in the oh, in factor. It will look like n factor. Now, this side I'm going to keep integrating. So this is minus uh, 1 over s e to the minus s t. Then it becomes plus 1 over s squared e to the minus s t. That keeps going. Now, when it gets here, I don't really know what sign it's going to be. Depends on the how the depends on the number of rows. Uh, you're going to see it's not actually going to matter. Um, so here, though, it would be 1 over s to the nth power of e to the minus st, which means if I do it once more, it's going to change the sign here. It's going to be 1 over s to the n plus first power of e to the minus st. Right? And then we can do the tabular integration. This times this plus that times that, minus that times that, that times that, that times that. Ultimately, what we end up with is going to be <coughs> minus t to the n over s e to the minus s t minus n t to the n minus 1 e to the minus s t over s squared dot, dot, dot. We're eventually going to end up with something like Now, if you start to take the limits here as you approach infinity, 
t to the n times e to the minus s t, what's going to happen there? Uh, zero. They'll go to zero. You can do that by low close rule. Uh, so eventually, though, uh, we are going to have. How do you know the last term is negative? What? How do you know the last term is negative? Yeah, yeah, that's for negative n factorial over s to the n plus 1, how do you know this is the negative, not a positive? Okay. <laughs> so, now, uh, if I plug in zeros, what's going to happen? Everyone with a t is going to die, right? Because I'm just plugging t equals 0, and the e to the 0 is going to be 1. So I'm going to end up with the n factorial over s to the n plus 1. That's going to be good. Yes. Uh, they have tables for these, right? They have tables, yeah. Right. Now, however, there are times when we might ask you to compute one. Just just to show you know what it means to compute one. Um, but yeah, in general, I will be providing a table with you with these. Now, uh, to talk about the sign here, we can actually go through an argument to show you that it, it's always going to be positive. You can say, imagine if n is odd, what would happen? Imagine if n is even. Uh, turns out, the Laplace transform of t to the n is actually going to be the positive of n. I'm not going to do that because that's going to be a gnarly integration by parts. That the Laplace transform oh, can be shown. Let's actually just. At this point, I'll give you a table. So, eventually, you get the idea of how we can get these. But eventually, uh, we're going to give you a table where we say, okay, here's a kind of function. Here's what the Laplace transform of the function is going to look like. So we kind of know that k's, if it's a constant, it will like k over s. Uh, we would know that if it's uh, exponential, it's just a shift, 1 over s minus a. Here, s greater than a. We know that if it's t to the n, it will look like n factorial over s to the n plus 1. Now, there's going to come a point where you could actually derive, or say, sine of some constant kind of angle. And it turns out that the Laplace transform of that is going to look like b over s squared plus b squared. Try it at home, kids. Try it at home, kids. Then, if you do the cosine, if you do the cosine of dt, uh, it'll actually give you s over Right? But, I mean, fully appreciate what you'd have to go through to get that. Like, if I put in a cosine or a sine here, what's going to happen? It's going to be an integration by parts that eventually revolves on itself. Yeah. And then you have to do that thing where you bring it to the other side and blah, blah, blah. But eventually, you, you'll get here. Okay, so let's see who's paying attention. If I put e to the at times cosine bt, which is something that we've seen, we see a lot in this course, things like that. What do you think those guys are? Complex. The combination. No. Wait, wait. Shift the thing. It's a shift. Remember, multiplying by an exponential in the Laplace universe is just a shift. This is just literally going to shift all our s's. So this is the s minus a over s minus a squared. Oh. And this one here is going to be b over s minus a squared. Right? Multiplying by an exponential is a shift. Now, in your book, there's a much longer table with much more complicated functions where we know to find the Laplace transform of, but for us in this class, these are the, the worst. This is the only thing you need to know. And I will be providing a table like this whenever you're in the test. There going to, in the back, on the back, there's going to be a table of Laplace transforms where you can kind of look it up. Because um, the point. While you might be asked to actually compute one from scratch, 
actually find the Laplace transform or something. The point of us teaching this is not to actually find the Laplace transform, but is to actually use them for differential equations. We're in a differential equations class. So, how does this help us with differential equations? Well, let me derive something really cool for you. So, a differential equation is an equation that just has a bunch of derivatives in it. So now you should ask the question, well, what does the Laplace transform of a derivative look like? <laughs> so, if I wanted to transform something that looks like y to the n derivative, what would I get? Well, this is just the integral from 0 to infinity of y to the n e minus s t. Now, I don't know what that is, because I don't even know what y to the n is, but I could do integration by parts, right? Choose u to be e to the minus st, choose my dv to be y to the n dt. My du would be minus s e to the minus st. My v would be, so if I have something to the nth derivative, if I integrate it, what do I get? It's confusing, but it's the other way. It's n minus 1. You actually break down a derivative, right? So if this was the second derivative, you go to the first, right? If this was the fifth derivative, you go to the fourth. Right? Okay. So this actually goes down. So now if I apply the integration by parts formula, what is this actually going to look like? Well, it's going to be u times v. minus the integral of v du. So this is going to be plus s times the integral from 0 to infinity of y to the n minus 1 e to the minus s t dt. Now, what you'll realize this guy is, what's that? That's the Laplace transform of the n minus first derivative. So I actually go, got a lower level. What? Do that. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Right? By definition. Yeah. Now this guy here, you kind of are going to assume that the derivative doesn't go cray cray. Uh, we'll lose. So that's the assumption. So assuming your derivative is some silly function like a sine or a cosine or, or, or something like that, where once you actually do this, the assumption is going to be that it's going to go off to zero because the exponential is going to really destroy everything. And so if you actually now plug in zero for t, you're just this guy is going to become uh, y to the n minus one evaluated at zero. So ultimately what they actually show. The Laplace transform of the n derivative of a function is going to be <coughs> that should be minus. That's fundamental there. Minus y to the n minus 1 evaluated at 0 plus s times the Laplace transform of 1 lower. This is a very nice thing to know. In other words, what I'm saying is if I take the Laplace transform of, say, y double prime, I would get minus y prime of 0 plus s times the Laplace transform of y prime. If I took the Laplace transform of y prime, I would get minus y of 0 plus s times the Laplace transform of y, and so on and so forth. Y triple prime, the Laplace transform of that is minus y double prime of 0 plus s times the Laplace transform of y double prime. Now, why that's nice is it actually sets up a recursive formula for me. I can find each successive Laplace transform in terms of the previous Laplace transform. So here is where the gene stroke of genius comes in. What if I make the Laplace transform the thing I want to solve for? Make that the variable. Make that the subject of the formula. Make that the person of interest.
this. Now, I know you might not see it right now, but I'm going to write it down in like, and then you're like, that is so awesome. This will turn a linear OTE into a polynomial OTE. Once you get to the fifth degree or higher, there are no walk in the park. But I'd rather do a fifth degree polynomial than a fifth order differential equation. Right? Like, you, know, you, you, choose your, you choose your battles. You pick your poison. And the polynomial poison is nicer because we, we know a lot about that. We have numerical analysis. We can approximate them very well. So that's actually nicer. Here's, here's an example just for you to see what I'm talking about. So like, there's no way. Okay, let me show you. <clears throat> Suppose I have y double prime plus y equals 0. My y of 0 equals 0, and my y prime of 0 equals 1. You're going to see something that's even nicer. Now, how many would you have done this before? So R, squared. R squared plus 1, you get sine and cosine, then you'd have to get C1 sine t plus C2 cosine t, you're going to have to find C1 and C2, but blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's do this. Take the Laplace transform on both sides. Now, because the Laplace transform is really an integral transform, the Laplace transform of a sum is just the sum of the Laplace transform, right? It's the integral transform across the sums. So I can take the Laplace transform of each term separately. So I'm going to take the Laplace transform of y double prime, take the Laplace transform of y, take the Laplace transform of zero. Right? The Laplace transform of zero is going to be zero by x. It's just going to stay zero. Uh, so now, what I'm going to do is set big Y to be the Laplace transform of y. This means the Laplace transform of y prime is going to be minus y is 0 plus s times big y. Right? By that. I'm just plugging that in. But what is y of 0? That's 0. So this is just s times big y. I'm going to do, again, Laplace transform of y double prime. Well, that's minus y prime of 0 plus s times the Laplace transform of y prime. The Laplace transform of y prime was this. And y prime of 0 is 1. So this becomes minus 1 plus s times the previous equation. So that just becomes minus 1 plus s squared y. Obviously, the Laplace transform of 0 is 0. Now go and plug these guys in. <coughs> uh, plug this guy in for y double prime. Plug plug y in for y. Solve for y. That's a polynomial equation. In fact, that's the nicest polynomial. That's a linear equation in y. Just going to solve for y. So you say y, you factor out the y, you add 1 to that side, you would actually now just solve for y as if it were a polynomial. That's the y. That's actually the solution to the differential equation. However, it's in a different universe. That's like when I do a substitution, integration by substitution, I just got my answer in u, which is not good enough. I want to actually change it. So this means the Laplace transform of what I want is 1 over s squared plus 1. So now you might say, well, how do I get to the answer in t? Well, I have that table. So I'm going to look at that table, and then I'm going to look at, well, if something looks like this, what is the guy in the left in the left column, right? What is this guy? Um, not R ten. Think of all possible. The table you just copied just now. Look it up. Make sure you know how to look it up. 
Huh? Sine of t. Right? That's oh, look yeah. at the so table B equals, equals one. B yeah. equals one. Uh, That's the answer. Oh wow. Now I want you to appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to appreciate one. I just got to the answer by going through a polynomial equation. A linear polynomial equation. <laughs> linear in what? Two. Did you notice I didn't have to deal with any C1s, C2s? I didn't have to like set up a system of equations to find the It's built in. Like I get, I get the exact function that's supposed to solve it like right away. Why? I actually plugged in the initial conditions from the very beginning. It's built into the answer. So once I, I do this and I get here, initial conditions, they're taken care of. Don't have to worry about them anymore. Then I end up in a situation where Dude, that's a linear equation. Just separate the y's. Like, bring everyone that doesn't have a y to one side, factor out the common y, divide by that. You're going to get an answer in terms of s. That's the Laplace transform of the answer. What do you do now? Oh, go back to the table. Oh, if it looks like this, that must be the function it came from. That's the answer. Thank you. What would you do if you didn't have the table? Yeah. Well, you just derive it. Like, you literally do the integral from zero to infinity. Like the uh, sign, you'd rather just choose sign. To derive the Laplace transformation of yeah, it? Yeah, it will be the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of t times t. What if you didn't know the sign? What if you have to like guess? Yeah, to what? What if you didn't know the integral Laplace transformation of sine look like that? How would you go about it? Oh, solving? well, you wouldn't know. Like, like what? I'm, I'm teaching you the order of that we would have discovered things. Like, we would have already figured out what the Laplace transformation of a bunch of functions is, and we'd be able to actually recognize all of them. Professor, is yeah. there a way to go backwards without solving? Backwards without what? Like you have a Laplace transform, like you want to find the original. Yeah, that's called, this, this process by the way is called finding the inverse Laplace transform. So this says find the inverse Laplace transform. That, that's basically a way to go from the right side of that table I gave you to the left side of the table. And it turns out that it's usually going to be some sort of algebraic manipulation to kind of force it to look like the other side. So if I, this one is a very nice answer. Sometimes it might look like a mess here, but what you might do is like, you get partial fractions, break it into smaller fractions, and then, right? Multiply and divide by a constant. Try to do, you're basically going to try to force what shows up here to look like something in, in the table, and then you'd be able to do it. So, so sometimes it won't be so nice, uh, you might have to do, do something, right? Yeah. Is there a notation for the inverse Laplace? Yeah, you, you literally go that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to give you f of t. But we, we usually don't like write that down. You, just, you go here, and then you immediately jump to there. Can you calculate the inverse Laplace without a table? Huh? Could you ever find the inverse Laplace without a table? And without recalling or memorizing? Like mathematically. No, if you're going to find the inverse Laplace, you'd actually derive a bunch of stuff first. Like you, you go through the process of deriving because you want to know what that thing looks like. So um, this is this is like a pretty powerful tool. Yeah. Now you see why engineers like it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I told the engineers go crazy for this stuff. Like, yeah. this is like, like dude, I'm back in my pre cal now. Like that's where I'm. Looking. No, I can even see you putting like putting it into Excel or something like that and being able to figure out your time. Yeah, because you now you kind of trans you transform finding solving a differential equation into solving a polynomial equation. Yeah, that's a lot. And then you just ask the computer figure out break that up into the smallest chunks that you can and kind of match it up to this table I have over here. And you can even set the the computer to compute a bunch of these integrals, right? But the Laplace transformation is as powerful as is your table, or how long your table is. Yeah, it's uh, as powerful as uh, how comprehensive your table is, yes. Yeah, we need to but that. in most cases, uh, where you're going to be using this, it's going to be simple enough for you to get out. Uh, try, try these integrals. No. Not now, for next time. <laughs> we're, we're done now. But. Uh, actually, try uh, doing it with these. A.
I, I believe this was actually from a final. This is from fall 18, just so you can kind of see the level that you want. So very normally they ask you a linear equation with constant coefficients and it's homogeneous. Um, but just so you know about the non-homogeneous case. And yeah, you can find the particular solution and the homogeneous solution all in one shot with this guy. You have everything kind of built in. So uh, for this thing, what you do is when you find the Laplace transform of everybody, it's not going to be equal to zero. It's going to be equal to the Laplace transform of what that is. So you look up that in the table, you plug it in here, and then you solve for y. We'll get some mess over here, which you're just going to kind of split up, break it apart to try to see, can I break it into pieces that I'm seeing in this table? <clears throat> You can also use the Taylor series expansion to solve all of these, right? Yeah. So like a series solution, that's something that works in a lot, every, pretty much every case that we've done. Laplace transform also will work in a lot of cases, even in non-constant cases, but then you'll have to worry about <coughs> what the, the Laplace transform of that thing would look like. So in theory, yeah, these could, pretty much everything I said could work in almost every situation. It's just how difficult one particular process is to implement. Oh, did I have to give you the initial conditions. Y of zero equals zero. Y prime is zero. So we'll do that next time and move on to the Fourier series. It's going to be awesome. That's something else that's awesome. It's another kind of variation on, uh, let's rewrite a power series to fit our needs kind of thing. Yeah. Last day of class is the next day. Are we going to have a quiz next month? Are we going to have a quiz And quiz when you come back, and last day of class is the intro. Did you know what's the time? 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 What's